Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you if you are from Christ Church. Um, a couple, many from Christ Church uh, will be attending uh, with us this morning. I got a message on my way here that uh, the man who is preaching there, Nathan Shaver, uh, his father had an emergency. He had to go to ER, and so they've canceled their morning service and recommended um, people attend here or uh, perhaps Southside. So now they have the same problem I had when I was there a few weeks ago, trying to figure out if I'm sitting in someone else's seat, right? <laughs> At a certain point, you just got to go for it. I don't know. Uh, I got to, you probably are. <laughs> I don't know. I got a couple other announcements. Um, Pastor Ferris is uh, preaching this morning at the Emmanuel Congregation, and so uh, he is not here this morning because of that. You'll notice in the bulletin, though, that he will be leading our evening worship service, and he'll be taking us through Ezekiel 37, one of my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible, the Valley of the Dry Bones. So uh, come back in the evening if you're able. I'd also like to invite you, uh, if you're able, to join us for missions prayer. Uh, Our missions prayer will be taking place at 5.15 p.m. in the family room. And I have one other final announcement for you, and that is with regard to Ann Thompson. Um, I would imagine most of you have seen the email and know that uh, Ann Thompson passed away last week, and her funeral will be taking place this coming Friday. It's going to be here, and I believe she's being buried at the, seminary, or at the cemetery right down the street, and um, we don't have an exact time, so be looking in your emails. Um, some details about that will be coming in the next day or two. With those announcements, uh, we'll get to uh, doing what we've come here to do, and that's to meet with God, to hear from Him, to worship Him. I want to ask, if you are able, that you would please rise for our call to worship. It comes from Psalm 92. It's the first four verses. A psalm, a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Let's come before our God singing Psalm 92. Psalm 92.
Let's pray. Our mighty God, we would recognize that the one we stand before is high and majestic. Lord, you are more beautiful than we can comprehend. We know that. And Lord, we would confess before you that uh, we do not fear you as we ought. By fear, Lord, we mean reverence and love. Lord, you are glorious and good. It is good to praise you, to tell of your love in the morning and your faithfulness at dawn. Lord, to proclaim and sing of your good works, your loving care. Lord, you know that we need to hear these things, how your foes fall, even our foes fall by your hand. Lord, you have blessed us, you have planted us, We'd ask that you would help us to worship you this day, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, we would ask that you would reign in our thinking, that you would give us focus, and that our focus would be on you and on the glory of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. At this point in the service, we turn to our psalm of confession. Uh, This is really a point we've set aside for you to be able to come before the Lord honestly and confess your sin to him and ask for forgiveness. And we, of course, do this by singing his word, words, his words that he implants in our mouth. Uh, Let's come before the Lord and sing Psalm 130a, Psalm 130, Selection A. First John 1 John 1.8 promises that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. With this in mind, we'll come before our God in prayer. We're going to turn to our pastoral pl- prayer, our time of supplicatory prayer. We're going to pray through items that you'll find in your bulletin. We'll also cover some items that you might have seen in News and Views. We will also pray for Nathan Shaver and his father. Uh, Elder Donald Cassell is going to lead us in prayer, and then I will close us out.
Let us pray. Holy Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we, uh, we come humbly before you this day to uh, ask you to be merciful to us even as we seek to meet with you, that indeed you will, you will meet with us in the depths of our hearts. There are many things, O oh God, that uh, could fight against this, to dethrone the worship of you within our hearts and our commitment to you even externally. And we pray, God, that you grant grace that, uh, in fact, this will not be, that we will have the clarity of thought and focus and uh, we'll continue to practice very, very rigorously and very carefully the fruits of the Spirit. Indeed, we pray, God, that it might be seen in our lives because of your presence within us here. And now, O oh God, we come for the uh, state and nation. We pray, dear God, we know that in the United States as a whole, uh, we are greatly challenged. This is the case with the world, but we are praying here for the United States. We're greatly challenged with governance and uh, significant cultural changes and stresses within the country. Pray, God, that you might uh, uh, bless the, uh, the members of the U.S. Congress that have to make laws in many ways reflecting some of these changes. Uh, we pray God for sagacity, great sagacity in making these, uh, these laws of God. We ask uh, Lord for, for wisdom here, um, uh, for the, uh, the president of course, uh, his, uh, his administration uh, that would be a part of executing these laws and in some place in terms of uh, regulations uh, affecting uh, these laws. We pray God that they reflect uh, the reality of your presence here in the world. We ask you, God, also to be with uh, our state legislators, even as they consider uh, making laws re respecting the place of life. We pray, God, that in some respect, even though it may be beyond their kin, uh, nevertheless, in some respect, even as they make these uh, legislative changes reflecting uh, the recent Supreme Court decision on abortion, we ask, oh God, that it might be in some respect winsome in a way to allow people to, uh, to appreciate the debate has to do with uh, the value of life and not necessarily uh, choice. We ask of God for that, that you may be merciful uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the state legislators and that they can be a part of the expansion of your kingdom, your kingdom of righteousness and peace of God. We pray for that uh, and love, we pray for that uh, that kind of wisdom to be a part of them. We also ask your God for uh, to be merciful to us and hear our prayers concerning the Anugraha uh, RPC. We thank you, God, that is in India. We thank you, God, for the desire to try to expand their witness in India. We pray, God, that you might bless that desire for growth. And we ask, oh God, that the growth might not only be external, but internal in terms of the individual members. And it might not be only in terms of the better understanding of the confession or the greater uh, understanding of doctrine, but truly growth in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and a real celebration of, uh, of the good news uh, that others will see in their lives and want to be a part of. We ask you, dear God, uh, also we come humbly thanking you, rather, for the arrival of the uh, Smiths in uh, Uganda. We pray, God, that we thank you for the fact that we've been able to gather all of the things that they wanted to put together uh, to be able to go into South Sudan. And we pray, God, that, in fact, uh, that uh, plane trip might materialize on on Tuesday uh, of this week, and that it will be uh, a real blessing for them, that they will in fact go, uh, take the plane, and arrive back in, uh, in the Sudan in, in one piece. And we pray, dear Lord, also for the B family in Central Asia, that you continue to bless them, especially with the arrival of a new child. Um, we ask, O oh God, in case of both of them, uh, the Smith and the B family, O oh God, that uh, uh, you might uh, increase the team with uh, a long-term commitment and high-quality people uh, that will uh, be a real face of the gospel in, in an environment, uh, in some cases, that is very unbelieving and sometimes even hostile or so. And we pray, O oh God, that especially in the situation of South Sudan, where people are truly looking for your kind of wisdom, that you be able to uh, grant that to them and bless the uh, the Dinkas and the other uh, tribal people in that area, oh God. Hear our prayers for, for the witness. We also, uh, Father, ask you your grace upon Geneva College that its long-term witness will continue and not continue only uh, but expand. Uh, they, will, they will see real growth uh, and not only in uh, 
in, in, in terms of the number of students that attend, but also in terms of uh, uh, the, the purpose for which it's been established for your greater glory, uh, they become a, a force for intellectual good within uh, that part of the, uh, the United States and that part of the state, and even so in the United States as a whole, uh, attracting people from all around the world to God. Uh, we also pray, oh dear God, for uh, the young people uh, in our congregation here uh, for their continued education and welfare, even as to go back to school, O oh Lord, that you might bless with strength, and make them strong, cause them to grow and be filled with wisdom and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, that you will bless them, O oh God, that they will be in good health. We ask, O oh God, for the local ministry of heart change. Uh, we thank you for the way you have grown and developed that ministry in a sizable way. We thank you for the quality of people that have been a participant of that ministry, and we ask you to continue to bless it, even along with a purposeful design. We pray also, dear God, for uh, the, uh, the parents and the grandparents here, that uh, you might give them grace in terms of knowing very well their responsibilities. We ask you, God, to give us, uh, who are elders and, and responsible for teaching here, to be able to help those families, uh, even uh, not only formally, but informally, oh God, as they grow their children, and even as we uh, begin to play the role of grandparents to be uh, good counselors to uh, the young uh, families that are in the church here. We thank you, God, for the, for the great witness of Anne Thompson's life, very consistent and stable. We pray, God, that as we celebrate her life here, that all of us will uh, begin to uh, really uh, rejoice in that, but also look at it as, a, as an example, something that we can also follow, uh, oh God, how, how it is that she was uh, faithful, faithful to her family, faithful to her husband, and faithful to her God, that we can we can learn from that and incorporate that kind of faithfulness and commitment to you in our own lives. We, we pray, dear God, that you, uh, in, in spite of the sadness of her departing from this life, as is the case with death, that her family w will be comforted, comforted in knowing where she goes to be with you and comforted in knowing, knowing the great legacy that she's left behind, the legacy of commitment to you. We ask, O oh God, to hear our prayers uh, for Doc Sharpino's uh, brother who has died recently. We pray, God, that you might bring comfort to their hearts also, to the hearts of that family, O oh Lord, and help them more and more to look uh, to you. We pray, dear God, for the, uh, the Bible school here. We uh, thank you for the, uh, the way you've blessed the Sunday classes here, the school, um, during the summer here, O oh God. We pray for the children as they... Uh, have uh, that as they grow in their reflection on Pilgrim's progress, not only in terms of it being a wonderful story, which it is, but how does it affect their own lives? We ask, O oh God, likewise for the adults as we meditate and ponder, ponder the Westminster Confession to Faith, that we might not look at it in a narrow confessional way, but to see it as an, an attempt uh, to articulate with some degree of clarity uh, the gospel. At his, as has made itself felt in the world. Yet now, O oh God, our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we would also like to lift our sister Joy Falk to you. Lord, you um, have made her aware recently that she has a cancer. And Lord, you know that she has been down this road before. And she knows how difficult it can be. Uh, we would lift her up to you and ask, Lord, that you would have mercy on her. Lord, you know that in the uh, coming week, she will uh, undergo uh, body scans as well as surgery. And we want to pray, Lord, that you would give her peace, that you would give her strength, and that you would give her courage. Lord, we pray that as she undergoes surgery, you would be guiding the doctor's hands, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them discernment, and that all the cancer would be removed. Lord, we would lift up joy as well as Bruce and ask that you would be pouring out your grace upon them. We pray that you would be bringing them support, that you would speak to them, uh, that you would help them in their time of need. Lord, we also think of our brother, Nathan Shaver, and uh, the emergency he found himself in this morning. Lord, we would lift up his 
Father, to you and ask that you would give the doctors attending him wisdom as well. Lord, we would ask, ask that you would help this man, that you would comfort Nathan and his family. And we think of um, others that are mourning in our midst. We think of the Bibby family from the Lafayette congregation, and Lord, we would lift them up to you. We pray that your hand uh, would be upon them as they've experienced death. Uh, in this recent week, in their family, we'd ask, Lord, that you would comfort them, that you would strengthen them, that you would guide their eyes, that they would look to you, uh, to the promises of your word, and to their Savior. I think even of my own family, uh, my sister-in-law dying and her funeral being on Friday, Lord, I would ask again that you would have your hand on my family as they mourn and as they... uh, think about ultimate things and the curse of death that's come upon us because of sin. Lord, we would um, ask that you would hear our prayers. We've prayed about many things, Lord, from the Congress to health to Bible school classes. Lord, we um, want to look to you and acknowledge that you have strength, uh, that we are weak and frail. We try to do our best, but Lord, it is often lacking. We pray that you would uphold us, and we pray that you would do um, all of your will in these things, and that you would put in us a heart that worships you no matter what, that trusts you with everything we have. Lord, we'd ask that you would strengthen us, that we might trust you. We'd ask that you would hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to prepare our hearts for the public reading and preaching of God's word by singing Psalm 23, Psalm 23, Selection A. This passage was uh, selected because of our sermon text. When we get to our sermon text, you'll see that it's about a widow and her only son has just died. And so she is going through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, Psalm 23 describes the believer's experience of belonging to the Lord. It's an invitation and an exhortation to all believers to find their trust and joy in God. I'd ask that you would please stand and we'll come before the Lord singing Psalm 23a, Psalm 23, Selection A.
If you would, please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to read two sermon texts this morning. We're going to read Isaiah 53, a common passage, and then we'll go to the New Testament and read our sermon passage. And I wanted to bring this passage to our attention because I just want to point you to Jesus. I want to point you to his character, who he was, what he was like, what he came to do. And then we'll turn in the New Testament and we'll... uh, Consider him some more. You're aware, no doubt, that Isaiah wrote this prophecy about the Lord Jesus 750 years before he walked the earth, and it is incredibly accurate. If you, if you read the New Testament, uh, you can see that. With these words said, um, I would remind you that this is God's holy word, Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors." From here, I'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 17. And just as you scan the passage, you'll notice that there are um, two stories. You'll notice your publisher is divided into two separate stories. One of them is about the centurion who has the servant who's sick. And then the second is our sermon text with the widow whose only son has died. I want to read this fuller passage just to give you a a bigger, broader sense of the context here in Luke chapter 7. So let's read Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. 
When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And the report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let's come to him in prayer and ask that he would make his presence known, even that he would give us ears and speak. Lord, we would come to you now and ask that you would do such a thing. Your word says that you preach through, or that you speak through the preaching of your word, and Lord, at that we marvel. And we would confess to you that Sometimes we don't hear your voice. Lord, we would ask that you would help, that you would help the preaching, that you would help the hearing. Lord, that you would bridge the gap. Lord, we would ask that you would speak to us. There are others watching even the live stream. They have other issues and distractions among them. Lord, we would ask that you would be among them as well. Lord, we need to hear from you. We need your help. Uh, We want to worship you, Lord. We would ask that you would instruct us, even correct us. We'd ask you to hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We all, uh, each one of us, experience painful losses in life. Sometimes we lose friends for various reasons. Um, As we get older, children leave the home. They go to college. They get married. The household changes. Sometimes we lose jobs, Uh, we suffer financial loss. Some of us have lost our dreams, we had big dreams, and then we have seen them slip through our fingers. Um, Others have lost or are losing their health. Some have lost a spouse. We endure gut-wrenching pain as loved ones pass away. But but perhaps one of the most painful things people endure is the death of a child. Parents who have suffered the loss of a child experience agony when they bury their son or daughter. They think of all the things that might have been, all the ways they pictured their life turning out that are now gone. And as we mourn our losses our own losses, as well as the losses of the people we love. We wonder what comfort God has for us, what comfort he has for grieving parents, and what hope we can have in life after death. Luke 
answers these questions by telling us what Jesus did for a mother who suffered the tragic loss of her only son. Jesus raises him from the dead and he gives him back to his mother. You can see that clearly in verse 15. You should be comforted by what you learn in this passage. In this passage, you see the compassion of Christ, his power over death, and the worship his presence inspires. So we're going to ask the question, uh, what comfort does God give those who are grieving? And um, where can we go to receive this comfort? We're going to start with our first heading, which is receive comfort from Christ's compassion. Receive comfort from Christ's compassion. Our text gives us the account of a widow who lived in the city of Nain. The city of Nain is a small town in southern Galilee, about 20 miles south uh, from Capernaum, where Jesus was. And it wasn't far from Nazareth, his hometown. The widow was probably very tired on the morning that Jesus saw her. The night before, she was no doubt desperate and scared. She only had her son, and now he was on his deathbed, and she loved him, and she didn't want to be alone. She couldn't be alone, and she must have sought the help of doctors and nurses, but they were unable to help. She likely stayed up all night with him, crying, praying, begging God to save him, wiping his brow, stroking his hair, speaking to him. But she couldn't save him. She couldn't help. Our text says that he died. So it must have been in the late afternoon when Jesus and his disciples approached the gate of the city. Jesus had left Capernaum where he was healing the sick. But as he approached the city, he was confronted by death, mankind's common sorrow. Friends from the community, perhaps uh, her synagogue, helped her to organize the funeral. Everything had to come together quickly. According to the custom of that time, the dead were buried outside of the city gate, and usually the same day they died. God gave us life, but we chose sin and came under judgment. If there had never been sin, there would have never been death or funerals or tears. But sin came into the world through one man and through death, through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin is the source of all our sorrow. And sorrow was evident in this funeral procession that Jesus was witnessing. We've all been part of funeral processions. You see them, we go to the service, then we go outside, we get in our car, they put that sticker on your windshield that says funeral, and then you get in that long line of cars headed to the cemetery for the burial. And as you go, they try to keep it seamless, you never stop. And if you see these cars, uh, you pass by and you wait patiently, knowing that this is a group in mourning. But we have the comfort and the privacy of our cars. What Jesus witnessed was different. A a substantial funeral procession was coming towards him. Uh, Women were weeping and wailing. Tears were flowing from the eyes. He could clearly see the red, puffy eyes with tears flowing down. People were walking with their heads down. He was seeing a lamentation, a full lamentation. Many people from the town had come to pay their respects to this widow because her loss was particularly tragic. In verse 11, 11, Luke writes, Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. 
it only took a few moments for Jesus to size up the situation and notice that the deceased only had one family member, a woman, and she was walking alone. She didn't have a husband, or as far as we can tell from the text, any other children. She had already taken this walk before when she buried her husband, and now she was doing the unthinkable. She was burying her only son. She was grieving again, and this loss seemed too great to bear. How would she manage? How is she going to manage the thoughts, the grief, the memories, the depression? She lived in a time where surviving as a widow was very difficult. She was surrounded by people, but she felt all alone. Consider verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. And we don't see it here in the English, but Luke uses the strongest words available to him to describe how this scene impacts the Lord. He's moved to the depth of his soul when he sees this widow's grief. This is the character of Jesus. He cares deeply for those who are grieving. He's full of compassion. We see this when Lazarus dies. Jesus witnesses Lazarus' sisters crying. He witnesses Mary and Martha overcome with grief. And the scripture says Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. You see, Christ's heart melted when he saw these two ladies in grief over the death of their brother. He's concerned about the sick, about the sorrowing, about the bereaved. Is he God manifested in the flesh? Yes, yes he is. But Jesus came down and took upon himself a human nature, body and soul. He has human emotions. You can identify with him, and he can identify with you. You can relate to one another. What's the point? The point is draw close to him. He knows. He knows exactly the feeling. He knows grief and sorrow and loss, and Jesus has extraordinary compassion. He's kind and full of empathy. Jesus sees and he understands. His heart goes out to those who are hurting. He came to heal the brokenhearted. And in our passage, you see that Jesus approached the widow as the procession drew near. He went to her and he said, do not weep. He's not being insensitive. He's not suggesting that she should bottle up her tears. No, he's hinting at the miracle that's about to come. His compassion leads to action. Jesus can accomplish things that are impossible for us to achieve on our own. The widow is going to receive comfort from Christ's power. That's our second heading. Receive comfort from Christ's power. The Lord turned to the widow, or away from the widow, and he approached the body of the son. The dead man was wrapped in a burial shroud, and he was laying on a bier. A bier is a flat, rigid stretcher that's normally carried by four men on their shoulder. And so they were carrying him on this platform with the shroud over him. Our text tells us that Jesus reached out and he touched the bier and the bearers stood still. His silent touch brought this funeral procession uh, to a stop, to a halt, and the pole bearers began to lower the body. The mourners, of course, in the back must have been puzzled and trying to figure out what was going on ahead of them. 
And everyone began to encircle Jesus to see what would, what would happen, what was going on. Because the one who had proclaimed himself the life, the way, the truth, and the life was coming face to face with death. The crowd following Jesus must have been astonished because he touched the funeral beer. And touching, that meant sure pollution according to the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. What they didn't understand was that Jesus was and is the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. And with his arrival, the ceremonial law was passing away. Jesus didn't become unclean by touching the beer. Instead of becoming defiled, he was in the process of conquering death and defilement. Then as the crowd watched and the pole bearers waited, Jesus spoke to the body that laid under the shroud. He said, young man, I say to you, arise. No ritual was performed The body was never touched. Jesus used only words so that everyone would see that resurrection power rests in him. The people who were near and could hear began to lean in. They wanted to see what was going on. Their eyes must have been opened wide And maybe some hope began to return. Look at what happens in verse 15. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. The dead man's cold, pasty skin became flushed with color. His chest began to expand and his breath began to move the shroud. The crowd must have gasped and began to step back as the man sat up and uncovered himself. And as he blinked and his eyes dilated and began to focus from the brightness of the light, he saw the face of Jesus. And he saw the face of his mother full of hope and wonder and shock. The text tells us the man began to speak immediately but it doesn't record what he said. But notice that when Jesus spoke to the man's cold corpse, the man heard him. The man was dead in body, but he was alive somewhere else. For mankind, death is only the death of the body. The human spirit lives on. When Jesus speaks, the dead obey. Don't miss the miracle that takes place here. Jesus summons this man's soul from the place of the dead and he reunites his soul to his body. He restored and revived him so that he was able to immediately sit up and speak. When people get knocked out or or they're hurt, they wake up in a daze. It takes a minute, right? Not this guy. He immediately uh, gets up and speaks. It's like there was no problem. All of this, of course, required supernatural power that is beyond comprehension. Jesus has power over the visible and over the invisible. He has power over the body and over the soul, over life and death. Jesus simply speaks, and the young man is alive and talking. How can this be? Jesus is God, nothing less. He has victory over death, and his victory is immediate and complete. The word of God speaks of a physical resurrection of both believers and unbelievers. When Jesus returns, he will raise the dead and unite souls with their body, some unto glory and some unto judgment. Regarding the resurrection of believers, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. The same voice, the same voice that raised this widow's dead son will be trumpeted throughout the world and the bodies of God's people will arise. Believers will be resurrected. On that day, you'll embrace your loved ones who've died believing. And best of all, you'll be face to face with Jesus, the one who holds the key of death and Hades, the one who has power over death, the one who is standing before the widow and her risen son. The people were, of course, astonished at what they were seeing. The circumstance was so hopeless, no one had even thought to ask Jesus to do anything about it. He simply approached the widow. Jesus has the power to do things that are impossible for us to accomplish. And in verse 16 and 17, we see the crowd begin to respond. They don't understand completely, but they know that this is the hand of God. Who else can do this? They receive comfort from God's presence. That's our third heading, comfort from God's presence. You can picture the scene. The dead man sat up and he began to speak. The crowd must have gasped. Those who witnessed this miracle were awestruck. Some in the crowd began to move back. Those who had seen, others who couldn't see, began to move forward and get closer. People in the back were beginning to ask what had happened, and soon everyone would see and hear for themselves. The son was dead and is alive again. Imagine if you saw a corpse come to life, get up, and start to talk. If you saw a son come back to life, sit up, and begin to just have a conversation with his mother, what would be your reaction? You would be shocked. No doubt your adrenaline would begin to uh, come in, and your heart would begin to race. You would ask yourself, what is this? What am I seeing? You would be astonished even at a loss for words. Luke describes the crowd's reaction in verse 16, writing, fear sees them all. You see, God's presence was evident. Fear gripped them, a holy reverence and awe. They knew this was not normal. Again, this was the hand of God. And in that moment, they recognized how small and simple and powerless they were compared to God compared to the Lord, whose power and glory is beyond comprehension. They had a holy reverence for what Jesus had done, and this caused them to glorify God. Soon intermittent hallelujahs and hosannas began to ring out from the crowd. Verse 16 says, fear seized them all. And they they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. So they began to celebrate Jesus and what they had seen. When Jesus raised this man from the dead, his deity was beginning to shine forth through his flesh. They didn't know he was God the Son, the promised Messiah, but they couldn't deny his power and they knew he was a great prophet. It had been almost a thousand years since anyone in Israel had witnessed this kind of miracle. In synagogue, they would have learned about Elijah and how that prophet raised a widow's son from the dead. They would have remembered Elisha who came after him, who also raised a woman's son from the dead. Ascribing this title to him was the best that the townspeople could do. 
but they failed to realize that Jesus was the Christ, the prophet that Moses had predicted would come in Deuteronomy 18.15, that great and final prophet that Elijah and Elisha were foreshadowing. The crowd simply understood that through Jesus, God had visited his people again, and they were full of praise. Who do you understand Jesus to be? I'm sure you know what the answer's supposed to be. I'm sure you know what answer I would like to hear, but in the quietness of your heart, who do you say that Jesus is? Is he the Lord over life and death? Is he your savior? Is he your Lord? If he is, then you know that God visit us in the person of his son. Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he was raised from the dead to give us hope in the resurrection. He sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and to walk with us and to be ever present as we pilgrim here. We should come before God with reverence and awe, worshiping Jesus and glorifying him for the gift of resurrection life. Knowing who Jesus truly is should fill you with zeal to tell others about him and about what he's done. Consider the crowd's response, even with their limited understanding. Draw your attention to verse 17. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. People couldn't wait to tell about what had happened. You know how that is. When something incredible happens, you tell everyone. You keep telling the story. If others around you, they're like, he's telling the story again? Right, you're excited about it. And we know that on the third day, after Jesus died for our sins, Jesus was raised from the dead. The gospel is not just the crucifixion, but also the resurrection. When we tell people about Jesus, we have a duty to tell them about his victory over death. Jesus offers forgiveness of sins and eternal life to everyone who trusts him. And this is good news for people who are afraid to die because it gives them hope in life after death. And Jesus' promises are sure. Death isn't the end. Through faith in Christ, you can receive the gift of eternal life. The resurrection is good news for people who are grieving but because it means that death is not the end. Those who believe in Christ will see others who believe again. In fact, they'll share eternity with one another. We all mourn losses. And when we are experiencing deep grief and sorrow, questions arise in our soul. Will this pain ever go away? Will I recover from this? Where are you, Lord? Are you going to make yourself known to me? You know this anxiety that I feel. Will you speak to me? Will you comfort me? And then the Lord responds through his word. The people who were there that day in Nain saw more than God's power. They witnessed his loving concern for those who are hurting. Jesus was moved deeply for this hurting widow. He brought back her son from the dead so 
that he could be reunited with his mother. God revealed his deep love and concern for his people. The Lord Jesus is full of compassion. He has the power to accomplish things that are impossible for us to achieve. He is present by the power of his spirit and he makes his presence known when he speaks to you and he brings you comfort and that leads you to worship. To know the hope of the resurrection is to know the joy of your salvation. This hope doesn't wipe all the tears away, but it can give us joy in the midst of sorrow. A day is coming when Jesus will say to the dead, arise, and then he will say, weep no more, enter into the joy of your master. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, when you brought this text to me, I had no idea how much death would be spoken of in these coming weeks. We thank you for your providential care that even in the midst of all of the death and all of the sorrow, you would remind us of the resurrection. You would remind us of your compassion that you would remind us of your power and that you would remind us of your presence. Lord, we would ask that you would help us in our weakness. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for speaking. We'd ask you to hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be responding to the preaching of God's word by singing our psalm of the month, Psalm 16c. As uh, you're likely aware, Psalm 16 contains a prophecy regarding Jesus. The psalm teaches that the body of the Messiah will be preserved, that God would not abandon his son, but would raise him from the grave. Stanza five says, for you'll not abandon my soul to the grave, your godly one you will preserve from decay. Life's path you will show me, full joy is with you. Your right hand holds pleasures for me evermore. Congregation, please stand and we'll come before God singing Psalm 16c.
may be seated. We come to our thank offering prayer. Our thank offering prayer is where we show our gratitude to the Lord for the things he's doing and he's done and the things that he has been providing us with. And part of our thanksgiving is the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you'd like to give to the work of the church, you could do so by um, putting uh, your tithe in the boxes at the back of the room. You can also do so uh, electronically if you prefer. Let's unite our hearts in prayer and give thanks to God for his goodness. Lord, we, we want to start uh, just by thanking you for our salvation, uh, for drawing us to yourself. Where would we be without forgiveness, Lord? Where would we be without your word? Uh, we want to thank you for our jobs, which enable us to give to the work of your church Lord, we would ask that you would bless our deacons, that you would equip them, help them to manage the resources given. May they be used, Lord, for the needy. May they be used for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, we would again give you thanks for the life of Ann Thompson. Lord, we would give you thanks for TFY, Uh, We thank you for raising up those amongst us who would invest in our youth. We are grateful for them, Lord. We would ask that you would continue to build friendships amongst our youth. Thank you for rooting them deeply in your word, for caring for them, for providing for them. Lord, we uh, thank you as well for the elders planning retreat. We would ask that you would please give our elders wisdom and insight and vision as they care for your bride, the church. We, again, would thank you for the Smith's safe arrival in Uganda. We would ask that you would bring them the rest of the way to their destination in South Sudan. Lord, we have so much to thank you for. You are very, very good to us. We would ask you to hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. We've begun to uh, sing, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we've begun to sing through the entire book of Psalms for worship. And we are doing that consecutively, and so uh, this week we will be singing Psalm 15a. Uh, the goal of Psalm 15 is to examine the character and worthiness of one who is acceptable before the Lord. The entire list of qualifications in verses two and five point directly to Jesus. He alone is capable of fulfilling them in perfection and and satisfying the perfect standard set by God. Christ is our righteousness. In him we are reconciled to God. I'm gonna ask that you would stand and remain standing as we sing. Psalm 15a, you'll remain standing for the benediction and our doxology.
God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.